many the Calcutta and the Society for giving us this opportunity. And I echo what Professor Reeds just said. We had a small symposium on neuroendocrine tumors in the last thoracic forum. And things have changed so much in just this one year. I don't think surgical aspects have changed that much, so I'll quickly rush through and catch up on time if I may. Surgery is risky business, and neuroendocrine tumors is the biggest um, <clears throat> place where you can see how things change. And we still sit on an MDT, and the physician says, oh, it is benign, it's a carcinoid, we're not going to refer your patient, or it's typical and atypical, the patient's been cured. And the things have changed with us going back and saying, look, these patients need following up, these patients need periodic um, CTs and what have you, and the landscape is changing. I won't go through the incidents and the sites because that's been dealt with in detail. The spectrum of neuroendocrine tumors, Professor Reed's gone in detail. So the presentation to the surgeon could either be from the physicians, if they can present directly to you with as an emergency, which ha happens, and it varies as to whether it is a peripheral lesion or a central lesion, as Nick already has stated. What is the role of a surgeon with neuroendocrine tumors? We could be diagnosticians, because the minute they see something fleshy, the physicians will say, guys, do you want to do a rigid bronchoscopy in case it bleeds and you have the laser? We could be the staging physicians to get the mediastinal staging prior to intervening. We offer endobronchial interventions, which largely tends to be palliative rather than a curative uh, with a changing mindset, unless it is a tumor which is not for a surgical resection. And finally, surgical resection, which is a curative uh, approach which we offer the patient. So the surgeon comes in to offer a variety of things in these patients. We've heard a lot about the imaging, so won't dwell on them. You have the experts telling you. And I'd like to just point out, we did look at the PET scan across the country, which Eric led, uh, which showed the new <coughs> PET, what's the hefty PET was not the ideal investigative modality. So the biggest concern with physicians is it looks fleshy, it will bleed. And these patients can bleed sometimes even necessitating emergency thoracotomy or calling your friend to come and help you in theater. I think in the last 10 years I've had one. Ms. Nakas's eyebrows is going up. And the needle biopsy can change histology. We can't emphasize the importance about having adequate tissue to the pathologist because the tumor markers and the biology can be better studied with a good sample. And frozen section in this setting, you have a peripheral nodule. Most of us would say, if the radiologists say we can't get the nodule, we'd say, okay, we'll do a frozen section. But frozen is not going to be ideal in this cohort of patients. You've seen that. We still end up doing the lung cancer staging, but that probably will change. And the next question is, is there a role for induction therapy in this? But I'm not going to dwell on it. I'd let Vask carry on to talk about the oncological pre- and post-operative management. When it comes to surgery, the aim should be a curative resection. A curative resection, especially in central tumors with parenchymal preservation. We want an anatomical resection which clears everything, <coughs> and we have to do a complete lymphadenectomy to get an accurate staging. You might consider a non-anatomical resection in a patient with poor lung function, more importantly as a diagnostic stroke limited resection setting. It has to be multidisciplinary clearly because you now have your specialist physicians and oncologists with an interest in the tumor. Complete anatomical resection with the lymph node stages, stay <coughs> resection as appropriate for the area. Is N2 disease an absolute contraindication in this cohort? And we could debate about it till the evening. And our net MDT tells us in select patients, even if there is isolated single metastasis, there is a role for surgery, but that's a discussion which we can have after vast presence. So coming down to the surgical options in these patients, it depends on where it is. If it is peripheral and a patient with poor lung function, you have the options of doing a limited resection by the way of wedge or segmentectomy if it lends itself. 
lobectomy, bilobectomy. But if it's a central tumor, you want to preserve parenchyma. You want to take the lesion with as much lung preserved, either as a sleeve lobectomy or an isolated anatomical sleeve. The palliative options are for more of debulking and getting a patient prepped up to do a curative resection if it lends itself. If not, it's as a palliative. If you have the technology, your CT scans lends itself to anatomically localize where your tumor is, as well as to identify your segmental vessels to help you do a segmentectomy. Clearly, there are some segments which are easier than others. <clears throat> and whether you do it open or thoracoscopically depends on your local experience and what your capabilities are. But the key is getting a good clearance margin and an anatomical resection. So sleeves are useful in this setting, and if you look at the society returns, for whatever reason, it must be the water in Leicestershire, our sleeve rates graph goes up significantly as opposed to the rest of the country. The rest of the country is about 2 to 3 percent for whatever reason. Leicester, it's about 15 percent. So there are areas which give you the option of sleeve. The right upper lobe lends itself well, the apical segment, and likewise, you can do the same thing on the left side as well. So the principle is to anatomically remove your tumor and reanastomose the two ends of your bronchial margins. This could be an anatomical sleeve, or you could just take a bronchial segment out and preserve your lung still in the back. How do you do it? Again, it varies from surgeon to surgeon. I'm old school. Uh, Frank Collins always used to say you do them interrupted. So I still do interrupted vital sutures. But if you speak to the transplanting surgeons like Mr. Calcutt, he'll say I'll do a running suture on the anterior aspect and do interrupted. So it is what you think which will give you a safe anastomosis. And wherever possible, buttress your anastomosis with uh, intercostal flap or a tie from, so, so, sorry, a pericardial pad so that it is protected. If it is a peripheral nodule, you need to palpate it. You may get image guidance if you have the technology so that your thoracoscopic resection is easier. And we're moving away from big thoracotomies to doing them all thoracoscopically. Where it is determines, and in the essence of time, I'm just going to go. And we've already seen these slides. If it depends on the histology, your survival varies and improves. And more importantly, the lymph node involvement actually gives you a better prognosis. I mean, there are various groups with varied lymphadenopathy and lymph nodal spread. <clears throat> and their survival clearly is different depending on the nodal involvement. So if they have a node negative uh, tumor, clearly your survival was much better than somebody who had nodal disease, and this varies accordingly to the various cohorts. You've seen the slide already, so I won't dwell on it. But the importance to em emphasize for surgeons and the registrars is use the wealth, which is your multidisciplinary team, and get them to your local neuroendocrine MDT so that the patients can be treated accordingly. In Leicester, we've now had our neuroendocrine MDT going on for the last year, which started off as a Leicester MDT. Now it's becoming a South Midlands referral MDT with all the neuroendocrine tumors from Northampton, Kettering, and Peterborough making its way to the MDT, which makes it easier for the patients. There are non-surgical management. I'm a surgeon, so I'm not going to talk about them. And finally, to finish off, endobronchial therapies, when your patient presents to you, it could be an assessment in preparation for surgery. So there is a central tumor. You want histology. You want to prepare the patient. You can take biopsies, use whatever is available in terms of laser uh, or cryotherapy to open up your airway. And once you have your histology, you can then go back in to definitively resect the tumor. However, there are conditions where it may just be a completely destroyed lung or the patient's too poor to actually undergo surgery, wherein you would just use them as an endobronchial therapy with a view to palliate their symptoms and open their airways. So as you can see, there is a nice 
lumen uh, <coughs> uh, centrally occluding tumor. So you get the histology. And what lies beyond is going to dictate what you treat. So in this case, you have the lung, which is completely collapsed and destroyed. So you're going to do uh, lobectomy. But prior to doing that, you're going to open that airway with laser so that you can get diagnosis as well as things. You could have sub mucosal lesions, so your biopsies have to be deeper to get the right answer. And I want to talk about adjuvant therapy and so forth. And we've heard about men's. So patients with pulmonary neuroendocrine tumors have good long-term outcomes, but the importance is having them discussed in a neuroendocrine MDT. And we can't emphasize enough about following it up in a proper MDT setting. And we may have to look at what is coming out of the Euronets and the UK registry, which will probably guide how we are going to be dealing with these tumors. A year is a short term in terms of thoracic surgery, but in that year, neuroendocrine tumors have gone, uh, undergone a big change, both in terms of the pathway, as well as in the options with multimodality treatment, diagnosis, and so on. So when we repeat this session, probably in a couple of years or next year, it'll probably improve more. Thank you.